It's time once again for another edition of Talk To Me. And now, here's Emmy himself, eight-time Emmy Award-winning journalist, Maynard Eaton. Hello again, and welcome to a new edition of Talk To Me. I'm your host, Maynard Eaton, and joining us is Dr. Phyllis Dawkins and Dr. Johnny Parham, both instrumental in a new program called the HBCU Executive Leadership Institute. Dr. Parham, HBCUs you've been involved with have been popular of late. We've heard a lot about them. Uh, you are a former Morehouse man. I went to Hampton. Why now, why suddenly have HBCUs become in, in the news, you think? Interestingly enough, I guess it kind of took the murder of George Floyd yes. to create some kind of broader awareness of just how important institutions are that serve African Americans. And so you've seen some kind of, of gravitating to supporting not only uh, historically black colleges, but also uh, many of the community-based organizations that serve our community. So basically that's the environment in which we're, we're living. But let's bear in mind now that this is not the first time that we've gone through this cycle. Let's remember that following the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King, there was again, a kind of gravitating to uh, African-American institutions. That's when actually many uh, municipal governments began to establish affirmative action programs. Yes. Many of the traditionally white institutions began to establish really uh, aggressive uh, programs to recruit African-American faculty and staff, as well as students. But then we go through these cycles in this country, as you are very much aware. And that's where we are today. We're in, we're in the midst of a very important cycle. Now, the question is, how long will it last? Will it last? Dr. Dawkins, you're, you're a former president of Bennett College, as I understand it. What's your sense of where we are now, where we've been and where we are now, you think, with regard to HBCUs? Oh, and we're all so proud of. You know? Yeah. I just recently rotated off serving on the president's board of advisors for historically black colleges. And um, during this pandemic, uh, the historically black colleges have received a lot of resources. And most recently, uh, when I was at Bennett College, we started the uh, deferment process for the HBCU capital loan program. And during that period, working with UNCF and uh, Michael Lomas and Rodrigo Smari, uh, we were able to get 13 institutions to receive deferments on their loan payments. Then in December, uh, the government um, forgave all the loans, all the loans to the tune of a billion dollars. Well, that so, was a breath of fresh air, I'm sure. Yes, and that goes along with what Dr. Parham just said that because of all that attention uh, that was given to the George Floyd and other racial ec and, and uh, equity initiatives, HBCUs have benefited uh, from this time. And so, yes, we are beginning to see a lot of resources poured into our institutions, but we still need more. What's the state, of, would each of you say, of the HBCUs today? I mean, this summer was still struggling, Morris Brown being one of them. And I'm told, Dr. Dawkins, you helped keep Bennett College alive with your fundraising efforts. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, the small private institutions, whether it's Bennett College, Morris Brown College, or any of the small private UNCF institutions, we many of us struggle. And we struggle because we didn't start with a, a sound financial base. Right after slavery, during we never received reparation uh, funds. So all of us uh, were found in the basements of churches and homes without um, adequate funding. And so we have survived. We have survived 
over a hundred a uh, hundred years, um, almost two hundred years. Okay, since uh, the first institution in 1938 with Cheney University. Yeah. So many of us are still alive. I think at one time we had 140. We're down to 101 accredited institutions and 105 still exists. Mars Brown is just recently uh, receiving attention from TRATS. Bennett College is has submitted an application to TRATS. So they're on their way to stability as well. Dr. Parham, uh, you're in the funding end of this uh, HBCU thing as, as a, a, a participant or head of the Thurgood Marshall Fund. What's the status from where you sit? I mean, are, are we still struggling or have many HBCUs turned a corner? There used to be a question about the education you receive. Now it's a question of can many black students afford to go? Well, what you have in the funding realm are continuing challenges. Right now, as we earlier mentioned, we're going through a cycle but I don't think that there is a single historically black college today that is not in need of money. Basically, if you compare the HBCU network with PWIs, you have a difference between night and day. They, the PWIs actually have endowments and those are crucial right. to the operation of a school. Uh, historically black college presidents, they basically have to continuously raise money. It's I describe it, uh, I compare it almost with the myth of Sisyphus. When you <laughs> basically uh, reach the top of that hill, basically the boulder comes pouring back on you and you began the process again and again. Nevertheless, these are institutions with leaders who I describe as making bricks without straw. Basically, they perform absolute miracles yeah. with the dearth of resources that are available to them. And that's that's the miracle, frankly, of, of, of black existence. You know, this is this is nothing terribly new. We certainly would prefer uh, a, a different avenue, right. but this is the way it is. Uh, and 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 so, people basically who largely lead our institutions, like people like Dr. Dawkins, who basically uh, pulled Bennett College. Out of, out of the brink mm. of total dismissal. They would have been gone had it not been for Dr. Phyllis Dawkins. So, and, 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 and in many respects, this is not totally unique. <laughs> They're constantly in a challenge to raise money, but then once the monies are in place, there is the need to also have the capacity and the sources, the resources along with the necessary staff mm -hmm. in order to apply those resources to constructive means. And this is how we are, are currently placed with regard to the Executive Leadership Institute. It's to train the next generation of presidents, of college presidents, as I understand it, correct? Will that be? Uh, as a project director, uh, Ms. Dawkins, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Dawkins, and yes, you, Dr. Parham, as, as a co-chair, co if the first order of business is teaching them how to raise money, would that be the first? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, that's one. That's one of 13 competencies. <laughs> okay. So we have spent almost two years developing a set of competencies that every president should know and be able to perform. And one of those competencies, it is fundraising, okay? Uh, leading and then leading with finances is another one and another popular one. Uh, and these competencies were developed and validated and surveyed. And we, we, we conducted a whole process uh, to 
uh, ensure that these are the competencies that HBCU presidents need to know. And so uh, board governance was number one, fundraising and uh, leading finance. So I think those were the top three. Uh, and so those, and then enrollment management and academic programs. And so, yes, uh, fundraising is one of many competencies that the fellows will be exposed to. Dr. Parham, how did the ELI come about? What's, what, what, what launched this? The popularity of HBCUs or the desperate need for new leadership? Well, Dr. Lewis Sullivan, who is the founding president of Morehouse School of Medicine and I, were um, actively uh, focusing on uh, the recruitment of a president for Morehouse College. I got you. And after that process, basically, we began discussing really how are generally presidents selected. I reflected on my experiences both with UNCF and Thurgood Marshall, and Dr. Sullivan, with his full awareness of not only uh, developing a from scratch a medical school, but also his awareness of the operations of Boston University, we began discussing the need really to, to, to perhaps set out a kind of more inductive process of identifying leaders. Uh, Many times, um, and really from my own experience, uh, a president may be a, uh, a, a, a formal mentor of a trustee, uh, a president who is ultimately selected may have been an outstanding uh, professor in the classroom. And then that president goes into at the helm of a, of a college and all of a sudden that demonstrated capability is challenged. And I think that we see the results of that. Let's look at Morehouse College. Over the past 12 years, Morehouse College has had three presidents. Wow. Three presidents. Um, right now, within the Atlanta University Center, I think that the, the dean of presidents right now has been there for five and a half years. Dr. French? No, that's that's Dr. Campbell at Spelman. Right. right. Uh, and frankly, uh, she really the senior uh, member of the president's uh, cabinet would be Dr. Rice, who's president of the Morehouse School of Medicine. She's been on the campus of Morehouse School of Medicine for 10 years. And I don't recall exactly how long she's been president, but I would say she's probably uh, maybe six years. Um, and so that's that's what we have in terms of, of senior members of the Atlanta University Center, which is perhaps one of the most important centers of higher education for African-Americans in the world. And that's Why is that? Why is that? Is, is it tough to find a good college president? And, well, and, what is, and what is the making of a good HBCU president? What are you looking for in a, somebody like that? Dr. Dawkins? Oh, really so uh, so uh, Dr. Parm just hit it uh, exactly. The average uh, length of an HBCU president is about 3.3 .3 years, as reported by Dr. Kimbrough in 2017. And during that same year, the average president, the length of a president at majority white institutions was about seven years. Okay. And so that's why we are launching this Executive Leadership Institute at Clark Atlanta University. We're trying to provide the competencies that new and existing presidents need to have in order to survive. Uh -huh. And uh, I will say they have to survive board governance. Remember I talked about that earlier. What, is that, what exactly survive. does that mean, man? What, explain what that means, board governance. <laughs> is, is that college politics? No, no. Every, every institution has a board of trustees. 
Yes. Yeah. Okay. And that's called board governance. Okay. The role of the board and the role of the president. You hear on the news sometimes about uh, presidents and board members clashing. Yeah. Okay. I was one of those as well. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I wouldn't want anybody to go through what I went through. And so we're going to spend a lot of time during the Institute. In fact, we have secured Chancellor Martin from North Carolina a &T, President Campbell from Spelman, um, former president of Alabama State, a board. She will be one of the ones and a person from AGB to talk to our fellows about board governance. Okay. So I still think that's politics. I don't know, ma'am. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it is. <laughs> I mean, you, that's what you got to figure out how you negotiate that, how you, how you manage that. Okay, to survive. That's number one. And then quite often we walk into existing financial problems. And the problems existed while we were there and before we arrived. And then we got to figure out how do we stabilize the institution? And so that's when fundraising come in. That uh, That's when uh, you got to control your enrollment management. You got to increase your enrollment, retain your students. And you have to offer current and future academic programs that are marketable where students can get jobs upon graduation. Who is, what is the ideal candidate? Who's a quintessential person to be in your institute? Well, we're looking for individuals at the dean's level or higher, okay? Uh, people with experience. We would say, I'd like to say 10 years of experience in higher education and at least three years of administrative experience at the dean's level or higher. So we're looking for deans of academic programs and various deans inside the institution. We're looking for vice presidents. We're looking for provosts. We are also including new presidents. And also a new feature of our program, we are also including executive leaders oh. uh, from organizations and corporations because sometimes they end up being our president. And so they, if they want to know more about historically black colleges, they should also apply to be to participate as a fellow. How many folks do you have in this first class? It's, it's starting next month. Is, am it I starts right? uh, next month in June. The yeah. application process is still open. It, it closes next Saturday. So thank you for that question <laughs> on uh, Mar uh, May 15th. So uh, then we will select up to 20 participants. Dr. Parham, as I understand it, and, and heard people talk about your, your past, you were quite active in the Atlanta student movement and the civil rights movement. How important is the college president's uh, activism or history and activism work in today's HBCU society? Is it important that they have been in a protesting or been an activist in some degree? Well, a president doesn't, uh, him or herself, have to have been active. But the president should be very much aware yeah. of working with students in order to encourage and channel their activism. For instance, um, when I was, um, when we began the Atlanta student movement, um, I was then uh, attending Atlanta University. I was at the last uh, really semester of uh, completing my thesis and uh, about a few months away from completing the requirements for a master of social work degree. Um, following the 1960 sit-in by four students in Greensboro, right. we then began discussing the need for some kind of activity in Atlanta. Well, it was clear to the presidents of the Atlanta University Center that the students were about to go out and start some trouble. <laughs> some good trouble. Good huh? trouble. <laughs> um, and I'll never forget Dr. Rufus Clement, who was then the president of Atlanta University, convened a meeting in uh, Ware Hall, which is one of the dormitories on the campus. And his challenge to us was, 
your parents did not send you right. to Atlanta to fight the racial issue. And so basically we, we have a responsibility to make certain that you get an education and that we protect you. Well, that was his face. However, Rufus Clement provided us with uh, the boardroom in Harkness Call Hall where we convened all night meetings. Okay, so we basically had the support informally, but basically we had access to the boardroom at Atlanta University. Also, at the time, Spellman uh, was one of those schools where women basically were only allowed off campus uh, to go to Trevor Arnett Library, and they had to be back on campus. By sundown. <laughs> well, <laughs> nine o'clock. Well, the Spell Spellman students, who was then uh, Marion Wright, yeah. who became Marion Wright Edelman, she would sit in our meetings all night and she was allowed back on campus. Basically, uh, Al Mandley, who was the president of Spellman, clearly was aware of what was going on. He had a responsibility, not only to his trustees, but to the parents who had entrusted their children with him, but also he had to make certain that his students were protected. And so out front, they clearly said, no, you cannot do this. You must be careful. But clearly they provided the kind of support. And that's, that's the kind of leadership that we're seeking to develop here, to be aware of how important it is to recognize that young people are going to protest. And if you really try to get in their way, then you're being completely undermined, as was the case back in 1960, I believe when I believe the president of Southern University really did uh, set out to put up barriers to student participation. And there was just, you know, a real reaction to that. So this is this is what leadership is all about. And that's that's where Dr. Dawkins comes in, because basically when we're looking at the competencies, all of these of uh, 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 traits that really have to be addressed and inculcated by we feel uh, future presidents for HBCUs. Mm-hmm. Dr. Dawkins, this seems like a tough job, uh, but it also seems like a very, very important one. Mm -hmm. It is. It is. It is a tough job leading an institution. But also training leaders, right? That's what I'm saying. That's, that's oh, right. yeah. It's going to be tough. Uh, this this uh, Executive Leadership Institute is going to last six months, okay, in mentoring and coaching as a component of that. And that will continue up to a year. And so we have secured about 38 current and past presidents uh, to present in the program. So I told you about the ones that are presenting on uh, board governance, but uh, we have Dr. Abdullah from um, Virginia State. We have President um, Barrett from uh, Xavier University. We have Dr. French uh, from our uh, CAU and others uh, to present in the program. It's going to be well structured. And at the end of the program, we will expose the fellows to nine search firms that have agreed to participate and ready to recruit these uh, fellows. Uh, also, um, they will end the program with a certificate and the opportunity to earn micro credentials. So this, yes, this is a lot of work in this program. I'm, I'm fortunate to have a lot of support from existing and past presidents. Well, you also got Dr. Parr in there. But Dr. Yes. Parr, I want, I want to end this in one note, one little gr um, grievance I have. The NFL draft. <laughs> not, not one person, not one player from the 
HBCU. That just seems unfair and wrong. Well, you know, that's uh, that's a whole other topic. But <laughs> I, I, I honestly feel, though, that, you know, it, when you're black in America, you know, you become aware of certain yeah. kinds of expectations. And my guess is that with uh, Deion Sanders, Sanders going yeah. to Jackson State and also uh, offering some appeal to really these magnificent athletes, um, there are relationships that exist with the big schools. And they're not about to give that up. Because we're talking about big Million. bucks. Millions, yes. And, yeah. and and very honestly, I can I can tell you it's it's when I look at um, certain uh, sports, especially the NFL uh, and the NBA in many respects, it begins to look more like a plantation. You have white oh, yeah. coaches. Uh, you have uh, basically uh, they're, they're generating these these young black men are generating billions of dollars that are not benefiting anyone other than the schools. If they become injured, all of a sudden, they're off of their scholarships. I mean, it, it's like a slave plantation. So, you know, if you're running a slave plantation, don't you want to keep that going? It's very profitable. So uh, I, I think that this is the challenge that uh, Deion Sanders and others are, are, are encountering because they're, uh, they're peeling off prospects that normally would have gone to the uh, traditionally uh, white schools where uh, their budgets and their profits and their coaches who are earning more money than the Nobel laureate. Imagine a coach, yes, yes. a football coach, earning more money than the president of a school. Yes, yes. What does that tell you about a system? So. Um, I guess it's uh, we have to see how that plays out, but I guess it could have been predicted. Right, that's true. Well, I gotta tell you, as a product for HBCU, Hampton University, playing on a baseball team taught me a lot more than just how to play baseball. I, I, to me, that was part of my education, uh, being in sports and the righteous coaches we had at the time. And I'm sure that permeates till today. Yes, yes. Well, you know, Hampton, of course, with the uh, Dr. Harvey, he probably is the longest serving president of any college in America today, perhaps. Um, and so, um, you know, he's a, he's a very, he's on a unique class. <laughs> <laughs> well, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, you too are in a unique class and a challenging class to introduce this uh, Executive Leadership Institute. We applaud you, we thank you, and uh, good luck. Thank you. Here. Thanks so much. Ladies yes. and gentlemen, this has been Talk to Me about HBCUs. I'm Maynard Eaton. We'll see you next week.